chapter seven, so I think we're going to get into our program. Thank you, Rick, for your help with the oh, sure. AV equipment here, and thank you, John from Orca, for supplying us with this. What do you call it? Gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape. Um, <laughs> um, more importantly, thank you all to, for coming tonight. Good evening. Welcome to Bear Pond Books. I'm Samantha, the events coordinator. It's great to see such a crowd here for a poetry reading with Jody Gladding and David Hinton. That's when we clap. <laughs> they are both here celebrating the release of new books. The Spider's My Arms by Jody Gladding. I've passed around copies because it's advantageous to follow along visually while Jody does her reading. So if you'd like to purchase your copy after the reading, you may do that, or please leave the copy at the front desk with us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you I just wanted to say a few things about the books and then a few um, things about the event. About Jody's new book, the reviewer Darren Higgins says that each poem here is meticulously constructed to lead the reader's eye toward intersections of words and essential juxtapositions. What beautiful arrangements she makes. So if you can see visually, I'm sure you've all had a chance to look. They are beautiful arrangements. Um, David will be reading from Desert. Every time I look at it, I want to say dessert. <laughs> It's his first collection of original poetry in over a decade. He'll also read from The Wilds of Poetry, which shows how Chinese insights shaped innovative American poetry. And this new collection is an extension of those traditions, both spare and spacious, as vast and open as the desert itself. So don't forget to also buy your copy of Desert tonight. The register will be open all night. We will be doing a book signing after the reading. A few housekeeping items, please mute or turn off your cell phones. The front door is locked and will reopen after the talk. If you need to exit during the reading, please use the back door. If you need the restroom, it's also located at the back of the store to the right of the back door. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event at the Vermont Arts 2018 program. And I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They're here filming tonight's event. If you're interested in seeing this video, or if you would like to learn more about future events, please sign up for our newsletter. I'm going to pass this around. You have a lucky one. Oh, you're clapping. <laughs> um, I'd like to tell you about our next event. Um, it's called a Women Writers Showcase, part of our Rising Vermont Voices series with host Chris Bojalian. He will introduce authors Melanie Finn, Maria Hummel, Sarah Healy and Robin MacArthur. Those are all Vermont authors. They will read and discuss their work next Tuesday, September 11th at 7 p.m., so join us for that if you can. I'd like to introduce our poets. I'm sure many of you here know them already. David Hinton's many translations of classical Chinese poetry have earned wide acclaim and many national awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His recent books of essays are Hunger Mountain and Existence, a Story. He lives in East Callis and teaches in Columbia University's graduate writing program. And Jody Gladding's work explores the places where languin, excuse me, language and landscape converge, which we'll see tonight. She has also translated 30 books from French. She directs the writing program at the Vermont Studio Center and also lives in East Callis. Please help me welcome Jody Gladding. Um, thank you, Samantha, and thank you, all of you, for coming. David and I live in East Palace together. <laughs> Samantha was being discreet about that. That's <laughs> um, It's really nice um, for us to come back here. We worked at Bear Pond um, starting in 87 through 93, so... Um, and 25 years ago, I read my first book in this space um, with my baby daughter on my lap. <laughs> um, so this is kind of kind of a, a homecoming for us. And um, 
it's actually my favorite place to read. I'm going to start with a few poems you don't need to look at. And actually, I'd probably better if you don't. <laughs> and then I'll move to the other ones. It's like right to drop me down. Yeah. The it's it's sort of making me cross eyed. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. Can I'm still can yeah. you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. A litter box. Inside it a womb. The matted furry thing crawling in. In. That seemed all wrong. So I shook it free, tore the sack from its nose and mouth. Asleep in my hand now, breathing. Your eyes, they're the strangest color. She leaned right across the table to say so. I was taken aback, having always liked the color of my eyes. Still, I knew what she meant, my pupils convex, rectangular as a goat's. I gazed at her salad through the wire fencing, a small fist stuffed clover and grass blades. It's wild, yet it lets me nuzzle because it knew me as a young bear. What luck, my tongue along the rim of its mouth. A black bear's mouth isn't this black, its lips rolled back, teeth dangerous as cubs. My sister and I laughing whispered far into the night. One buck hanging dressed upside down from a tree. That was okay. But when the hunters got closer, all the trees turned to deer. I tried elbowing them aside like winter coats on racks. The prongs kept tripping me, their heads swaying heavy as hems. Well, what was I expecting, living where I do? Flushing low birds from trees, were they oak? Partridge? No, cedar, waxwing, tips, lustrous, yellow, orange, but I'd stayed too long. My life had passed in anxious adolescence. Still a student, maybe I could teach. I'd yet to amount to anything. Speckled, oversized, invasive, honeysuckle laden with berries. I needed to keep heading north. When her cry woke me, I knew to take it in, though why? Porcupine quills barbed like fish hooks rose from my haunches. I had birthed and raised my child, the winter diet of bark expanding to whimper, to howl, to moan. From below, we looked up into one bright fissure. No question of backing down now. No question of not getting through. Only how to wedge my body so small, the others behind me, all gentle, gentle creatures urging my legs, useless as fish on land, but angling my shoulders just so they'd fit another dimension. This one can't contain time to go first, time to show you I love the way. So those are from the center, uh, the central section of this book. And um, if you look at them, you'll see they're just kind of flat, kind of uh, um, horizon lines, I think, of the mask. But if you look at the other sections of the books, they, of the book, they're like all over the page. And um, what, uh, what the other poems are what I think of them as doing is, is creating, um, well, let me start this way. <laughs> um, my work has moved over the years from being kind of normal and, you know, left-hand margin and taking a little space on the page to like in, in my second and third books sort of moving across the page and spreading out and then, um, and then actually in the last book, moving off the page and onto objects and so forth. Um, so in this book, I was trying to figure out how I could keep experimenting with how a poem works in space, but do it using the space of the page. So making the space of the page 
kind of um, a three-dimensional and a, a sort of field where words can move around. So each of these poems has a through line which gets you started, gets you into the page. And then from there, you're pretty much allowed to move as you will. So the reader is very much a maker of these poems. And there's no one way to read them. Um, every time you enter a new poem is kind of created or can be created from the experience. So I will read them one way, but don't feel um, like it's uh, definitive at all. So I'm going to start with the first one. You all have it. One. <laughs> Although there is no one on the page. So actually it's, num it's page three. But that's not on there either. <laughs> it's the first poem in the book. <laughs> OK. Excuse me? It says first, right? Yes, okay. <laughs> Good, thanks. Sure. The hawthorn came into flower. The hawthorn in flower was my first alphabet. The hawthorn came into flower, a first white flame turning the alphabet to kindling. So I think of that one as sort of working like a double helix. Like there's the, the through line and then twisting around it is, is the other line. Um, the next one I'm gonna read is on pages six, is in, six and seven. And it, it goes a, across that whole field. And it's two parts. And you can see the, um, the through line is light, ice, water, ice, light. One, the icebergs. Calving, what I heard caving in like whales. And the light breaking off, blue, enormous pods disappearing too small to reproduce, though we tried the women to tend them, their enormity so fully changed any question of saving. Ice, blue, that sang, it's going to, although how can it be all right? Two, the library of water houses snow melt Core samples you can read through the history of glaciers. There are words for weather all over the floor. In Berlin, when it rains, plastic tubs like clints catch what drips through the library roof or skull, since the library was designed to resemble the human brain. I forget most of what I read a library in Alexandria, and then a daughter library. These columns are what's left of the glaciers, pulled from the shelves, the ice receding. What can be recollected? The sheer volume of each glacier, how they encase the earth, how they are crossed by the light. Um, the second of those um, is based on a actual library of water, which is in Iceland. Um, the installation artist, Ronnie Horn, set it up, and it is very much like I describe it there. It's really worth looking at her website. Um, there's also a, a poet in residence at the library of water, which I think I... <laughs> I hope I get to be someday. <laughs> okay, the next one is page nine. She's changing our shelters to open work. Unhinging the open from the in, outdoors, She's changing, 
nest cavities, hibernacula, sky blue, her simple open work, blue rock, blue rock. Pages 18 and 19. So 18 is, um, there are a few of these throughout where the, it's a kind of condensed version. I think of it as like the haiku version of these poems in that there's um, a title in bold and then there's a word or two in, in bold going through it. So um, that becomes the through line. So it's, hi there. Hi, trees. Hi there. Almost 30 years walking these woods, just now starting to wave back. Um, and the next one is field study. White, yellow, sweet, red, hop. Well, we learned the summer clovers, white, sweet, why not early, large-leafed, bog, rough-stemmed, the golden rod? Why not tall, yellow-rumped, common yellow throat, yellow, the confusing fall warblers? OK, now we're going to skip to the last section, page 48. The finest grasses support the most wonderful burdens of ice. Um, that line comes from Thoreau's journals, and actually most of, most of the through lines in this book come from other sources. They're they're mostly not mine, um, which I acknowledge at the back, usually. <laughs> the finest grasses will whistle held taut to the lips. Red wing, the last note held. Grasses support nests, wonderful facets of hoarfrost. Grasses will whistle, held to the lips, by bending. Till she could walk, I carried her, bending the light at my hip. Uh, 50 and 51. Uh, 50, the line, uh, blandness is this experience of transcendence reconciled with nature and divested of faith, comes from a translation I did um, of a book. No, actually, I didn't translate. I didn't translate that book. That I, um, it's a, there's a book I translated the author, but I translated a different book. The author is um, <coughs> Francois. Julien, and he's a sinologist, a French sinologist who writes about um, Chinese things, about French culture and Chinese culture, Western culture and, and Chinese culture. And I did translate another book of yours, his called The Book of Beginnings. But this comes from a book which is called In Praise of Blandness. And in the book he is, um, he describes how blandness is in the Chinese system uh, something to aspire to, that it, it's um, aesthetically the most refined uh, taste or value because there's no drama in it. It just, it's like, it's free of anything but itself. Um, so the line is that blandness is this experience of transcendence, that is, it, it's above everything else, reconciled with nature, it's not trying to escape nature, 
and divested of faith. There's no supernatural involved in it, which um, is kind of a difficult idea to get your mind around, but once you do, it makes things a lot easier <laughs> to, to um, deal with. So, um, in praise of blandness. Blandness is this common elder, white flower, white pith, so familiar as scarcely to require description. White hair, carte blanche. After losing his sense of taste, all those colorful IDs, my father still preferred white peaches. Her skirt wafts as she runs downstairs. My mother's summer dress, yellow with small black dots. How, years later, her skirt wafts, light steps, a birthday present as she runs downstairs. My mother's father, my mother's brother gave my father this umbrella, both wives dead, small black dots opening, one spoke bent now against the rain. Page 53. Um, libraries come up a lot in this in this book. Um, they have a kind of nostalgic feeling about them. And this one was partly inspired by um, the New York Public Library for a while was under threat of becoming something other than that, like cafes. And it was luckily saved, but this was while it seemed as though it was not going to be. So many remained silently sleeping in the libraries. Many were left unshelved or leaned a little in their dark stacks, remained sleeping like horses, standing like horses, silently browsing against one another, old books after the libraries closed. I'm just going to read a couple more, and then shall I read one of yours? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm going to let David read his own poems. <laughs> okay. Page 55. She pieces together her joy. She is one who looks knowingly upon complex modern machinery as a joyous substitute. She is one who looks to remnant species to patch together blue sky. An artist starts from the salvage of wetland, old growth. She threads through. An artist, I'm stuck. An artist, she is an artist. She don't look back. <laughs> and um, I'll end with the title poem of the book, which is on page 59. What I mean by rooted is wet. The spiders have been revising my lines, my arms full of laundry at the end of the day. What I mean by rooted is not taproot, but old stumps cling with web all the entanglements.
Does that work? Yeah. Can you hear that? Okay. <clears throat> I wake. <clears throat> that sounds loud. Is that too loud? No. I wake somewhere deep inside the blazing cascade of star generations. It's early spring, morning air cool, sun warm. I linger out breakfast, walk, mirror sky, the usual things. Life seems so simple sometimes. Who'd suspect this is how it happens? How that cascade of fire rips day by day through me, licking its wounds. <clears throat> Yellow sky parched grasses and sky. The less this desert is, the more I want to live my life over again. Ideas confuse me. They leave everything out. I am riding Earth's horizon edge, twisting toward morning sun. I am riding Earth's horizon edge through darkness light years deep. The desert stars are here with me. They must know where we're going, the desert stars. And they are here with me. <clears throat> Days go on like this. Sky parched grass and desert sky. Hummingbird. Mesquite seed fluff tight in its cracked, sun-scoured packet spills out on the wind. Sometimes I try to remember that distinction between what I am and whatever occurs next. <clears throat> it's the least possible hope. Food, water, shelter. Human history begins there, and I never leave those beginnings, really. Wander at home there, touching the possibilities of less. This mountain seems somehow lonely as I am. People come and go through its empty distances, and those distances remain empty. I'm getting old now, but this mountain's been here almost forever. No wonder it understands loneliness so much better than I ever will. Every time I come here, we both promise never to leave and mountains always keep their promises. The eye, the mirror deep eye is magic. Things seen go all the way inside me and vanish there. It seems impossible, I know, but everything heals from inside out. I guess you could call it a pilgrimage. I feel lost anywhere I go, though it's true the way is always clearly marked. Earth cairn, sky cairn, fire cairn, water cairn. So it's, um, uh, daunting to read after Jody. I just think those poems she, she's invented are amazing. <laughs> um, but she said, but I, I have to tell you, she said that you any, you can read it any way you want, but a few weeks ago we were sitting around and we read each other's poems to each, to each other and she didn't really like the way I read her. <laughs> <laughs> Jody? 
She complained for days. <laughs> The cosmos must be lonely. It's always somewhere else, watching itself through my eyes. It keeps touching ochre desert with my fingers, touching river water, her sun-warm skin. And listen, here in these words, why else would it be talking to you like this? <coughs> <clears throat> this one's a little longer. Traveling today, I found a river somewhere inside me. Wonder how far it wanders there, and how much sky it mirrors. All day long, wind and desert light, I followed that river's distances, shedding histories, histories, until I was nothing but river. Nearing mountains, I grew cold with snow melt, and evening wolves drank from my currents, tasting the clarity of water rinsing through every cell alive, always changing, always its own transparent self. The desert sees itself through many brilliant eyes, whole histories of eyes, antelope eyes, hummingbird, fox, lizard, vulture. It knows itself so perfectly by now. I wonder why it keeps talking like this. Um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and read a few poems from this book from last year, which is, um, uh, well, I'll just, I, just, I'll just, so it's American poets, and it's, I don't want to talk about what it's really tries to do, but so they're sort of predecessors for me, in a way, so in a sense, this is a kind of tradition, ancient China, and then the people in America who were at some deep level shaped by ancient Chinese um, ideas. Um, so I'll just read a few of these for fun. This is William Carlos Williams' poem. As the cat climbed over the top of the jam closet, first the right forefoot, carefully, then the hind, stepped down into the pit of the empty flower pot. Every time I read that, I remember, I always think of it as just a, the action of the cat. But there's the as at the beginning. It's like as the cat climbed over. It's like something else is going on while the cat does it, and but you don't know what. <clears throat> Always has made me want a jam closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robinson Jeffers, gray weather. It is true that, older than man and ages to outlast him, the Pacific surf still cheerfully pounds the worn granite drum. But there's no storm, and the birds are still, no song, no kind of excess, nothing that shines, nothing is dark. There's neither joy, nor grief, nor a person, the sun's tooth sheathed in cloud, and life has no more desires than a stone. The stormy conditions of time and change are all abrogated. The essential violences of survival, pleasure, love, wrath, and pain, and the curious desire of knowing, all perfectly suspended. In the cloudy light, in the timeless quietness, one explores deeper than the nerves of heart, the nerves or heart of nature, the womb or soul, to the bone, the careless white bone, the excellence. 
Um, a couple of short ones by Scary Snyder. It was really the beginning of poetry for me. That's when I, that's, he's who got me started. Created all the assumptions about what poetry was for me, like that it was about um, ecology, primal culture, Asian culture, um, Asian wisdom or deep wisdom. Burning the small dead. Burning the small dead branches broke from beneath thick spreading white bark pine. A hundred summers, snow melt, rock and air hiss in a twisted bough. Sierra granite, Mount Ritter, black rock twice as old, Deneb, Altair, windy fire. Oops, hang on. Oh yeah, this is a favorite of mine, I don't know. Anasazi. Anasazi, Anasazi, tucked up in clefts in the cliffs, growing strict fields of corn and beans, sinking deeper and deeper in earth, up to your hips in gods. You had all turned to eagle down and lightning for knees and elbows, your eyes full of pollen, the smell of bats, the flavor of sandstone grit on the tongue, women birthing at the foot of ladders in the dark, trickling streams in hidden canyons under the cold rolling desert, corn basket, wide-eyed, red baby, rock clip home, Anasazi. Oh yeah, I meant to, I was going to start this with somebody else, because this is, since Jody and I are reading together, so I was going to do a little autobiography, no, not really autobiography, but anyway, the first, when we met, we were at Cornell in the graduate school, and our teacher was ARM, and so I just thought I'd read a couple of his. Attention. Down by the bay, I kept in mind at once the tips of all the bulrushes, oops, the tips of all the rush leaves, and so came to know balances cost and true. Somewhere, though, in the whole field is the one tip I will some day lose out of mind and fall through. And then a funny little one. Reflective. I found a weed that had a mirror in it, and that mirror looked in at a mirror in me that had a weed in it. <laughs> um, maybe a few uh, poems by W.S. Merwin in, his, in the late 60s, it's kind of surreal phase. Kin. Up the west slope before dark, shadow of my smoke, old man climbing the old man's mountain. At the end, birds lead something down to me. It is silence. They leave it with me in the dark. It is from them that I am descended. Night wind. <coughs> All through the dark, the wind looks for the grief it belongs to. But there was no place for that anymore. I have looked too and seen only the nameless hunger watching us out of the stars, ancestor, and the black fields. I am going upstream, taking to the water from time to time. My marks dry off the stones before morning. The dark surface strokes the night above its way. There are no stars. There is no grief. I will never arrive. I stumble when I remember how it was with one foot 
one foot still in a name. Um, a few poems uh, really stripped down by Larry Eigner. Somebody I admire a lot, but not that many people are big fans, I think. Things stirring together. The wind. Fly objects. Birds shove out thermals. The winds tune how constructed things are. The instrument. Now we know. Listen. Light comes through it and water shakes. Clouds rain down trees. Fog. The rain and the stars in the head, in the head, beaches, slow clouds, the dark. Maybe, okay, and then one more that I don't usually try to read because I think is really difficult, but this is the end of autobiography because this is um, called Luberon. It's by Gustav Sobin and um, uh, Luberon is the name of the mountains where we, we've lived three times in France and Gustav uh, lived there too. Um, so, Luberon. Only there, in the hill's deepest creases, would you grow at last legible. Hear yourself happen in each dark, spark-hearted foliation. Weren't you, after all, your very own antecedent? The organs you'd bring mumbling into that arena of leaves, thistles, ledges. There, that is, where your breath at last might encounter mass. Wed then the interval of each articulated instant, the acorn that glows as if epiph epiphanous, oh, the acorn that glows as if epiphanous at its own according, for only the pleat finally speaks. And in the name of the neither, resonant echoes. Sometimes I need someone to be. It's another kind of refuge. I wander open ridgelines, sky stretching vast away to childhood. Heat waves ripple above ochre talus. A black-tailed kite circles out into blue distances. Memories float past like clouds. It's a difficult, it's a difficult proposition, a life story. Things happen, keep happening year after year, and they define who I am as they vanish into earth and sky. I woke early this morning, earth and sky still that one original dark, wind quiet, it's beautiful. I am someone else. Oh. <clears throat> uh, Ari 
read this and this is a little hard, but I'm going to read it because my friend Bill Jensen is here from New York and he has, uh, he's a great, really great painter and he gave me a, this, this thing is after a piece that he gave me. Thought gone, dark needs nothing more of itself. Needs dark, alone woven ink black through blackened light. It's an ancient tool, this gathering basket of shadow, and it glistens still with use. Hummingbirds quick glint, crows winged fleck of night. These last few things slip vanishing through, leaving again this dark harvest of origins. <clears throat> That's probably uh, too hard. I <laughs> shouldn't read poems like that. I wouldn't understand that. <laughs> <clears throat> Should I read it again? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm trying to decide if I should try to describe what this painting looks like, but it doesn't matter. Drawing, actually. Thought gone, dark needs nothing more of itself. Needs dark, alone woven ink black through blackened light. It's an ancient tool, this gathering basket of shadow, and it glistens still with use. Hummingbirds quick glint, crows winged fleck of night. These last few things slip vanishing through, leaving again this dark harvest of origin. Stories define us, it's true, and they matter, though they always leave so much out. I like it that way, keep telling them to desert, and desert keeps filling in whatever it is we're missing. The desert never mentions arrival. Solar heat, sky, dust light, a few parched colors. They rent so far through me, there's nowhere else to go. I set out. Wow. Every time I read, I discover something. I think I discovered I have two poems with the same ending. <laughs> well, that's all right, I guess. I can't, you can tell me if it's true. I'll read this. I can't think through these distances or how perfectly alone I am. Wind feels the same way, it seems, and this mid-morning moon. Meanwhile, Clouds drift past like words. Can I do that? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Molecular air brims distances between, furls breath. In its least breeze, stars rustle, gravity sighs. What else could I do? Here, everywhere on this mountain summit, it unclothes light. And who could stop looking further and further in at all that naked abandon?
Couldn't we simply forget what we wanted of these words we breathe out? Forgive me. I don't care much what words say. What I want is a way we can touch the same place in air. Um, what, <clears throat> just a couple, I'll just read this and maybe uh, two more. Water rinses stone steadily away, a promise it never stops perfecting. I'm made of stone dust it long ago scoured loose, and it keeps rinsing through my every glistening cell with its elemental promise. By now there's nothing to it. I can return so easily to stream water, thin across bedrock, weighed there through mirrored origins. Actually, maybe I'll, okay, I'll read, that's a string poem, just accidentally, I was going to read this from my last, the last poem, which is another string poem, but this is the, this is all desert landscape from uh, the southwest, um, where I've been going a fair amount lately, and I grew up, sort of grew up there. Um, so this is the poem I wrote a few weeks ago, and that's more from this landscape. How restless early morning light is, rock-strewn, sun-scald light blinding in wild stream water. It must be restless for home. It's setting out here, and where else could it be going? I wade in, further and further in. So, thanks. I guess we'll answer questions if people have questions. Both of us. Uh, so, with <clears throat> your, your poems about the desert, um, I was really impressed with your sense of spaciousness and almost like almost a sense of vertigo in both time and space. Uh, do you do you find that that environment comforting? Do you find it Uncomfortable. I know you said you grew up there, so does it feel homey to you, or does it feel sort of dizzying with how sort of spacious it is? Um, it just feels like me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't really feel. I don't think I feel comfortable. And I when I and I and I um, was glad to leave there and come to the northeast where it's green and and does feel kind of comforting. But now I'm longing for that. <laughs> heard that you can't go home again. <laughs> so good luck with that. Desert's always there. <laughs> David, I, I really appreciated that you read that drawing poem a second <coughs> time. And it reminded me uh, that I heard Kate Ryan read once down at Storm King Art Center. And, and she was the loosest reader I've ever heard. And she would say, I didn't read that very well. I'm going to read that one <laughs> and, and I really think that... You're saying I should have done that more? <laughs> no, but I think when I'm reading poetry, I, I will read a poem two or three times. I, I don't just read it once and mm -hmm. turn the page, and I've got the words in front of me so it can kind of sink in. So yeah. I, I, I'm really glad. I was thinking about Kay Ryan doing that, mm -hmm. and you said... Should I read that again? And it was <laughs> yeah. Because I I can't take things in orally, so I don't I can't poetry readings don't mean that much to me, except for just the feeling of the event. And I, and I guess you know sometimes I think about just reading poems a couple of times, but then I think well everybody here's smarter than me, so <laughs> they'll just be insulted. <laughs> uh, Jody, when you're, how do you go about formatting one of these poems? For you, 
writing by hand? Do you have a special program? Are you getting a space bar? What are you doing? Um, they start out by hand, and they they start out usually with the through line, and I have two different, I have a darker and a lighter pencil and an eraser. So like, I'll, I'll do the dark line, and then I'll start putting the other words around that with the light, lighter pencil, and I go, I like will, oh, here comes Barry. <laughs> um, I'll do probably 10 or 20 just like sketches of them with by hand before I go to my screen. And then it, it pretty much has to be already shaped by the time I get to the screen. And then it's pretty easy. I'm just, you know, it's a bold line. I'm spacing and tabbing over. I, it's just a word program at that point. Yeah. Right. So, like, kind of with that, I know one thing I noticed you do, um, I think more than once, but definitely on uh, 153, there's the little line that's standing like horses, and at one point it was sleeping like horses, and I mm. wonder how much of that comes from you constantly revising, or just yeah. that's how freely you want them read, where the standalone things can actually be swapped and move around more. Because you'd like... Yeah. Um... I, I probably want that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, my sense when I'm moving things around, I'm often moving things a little closer, okay. like spacing up or moving it in so that the eye will find that whole constellation and start playing with it. And, um, and then the bowl, you know, will hit you first, but then you can see the other in, like, the side from the side of your eyes, they're so they're sleeping. kind of happening at the same time. And because horses stand sleeping, right. you want I, I wanted that, mm -hmm. yeah. So, poems often make a leap in a way that prose doesn't. Prose tends to right. not trust the reader to have to like jump and land somewhere. <laughs> How much did you count on us, like, being willing to leap? Are there anyone who inspired you to test um, how far we can leap before we don't land on the other side? Or, <laughs> it's a kind of an odd question. Our, yeah. our basement is full of dead guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me that the mm -hmm. linear nature of language has always been problematic. Like, I don't think that way. I start a thought, and then it's going in five directions, and I have to trace it out when I'm talking in a linear pattern, but that's not reflecting how my mind is working. And I think that's a fairly common experience. You know, if you, you're looking at me right now, but you're thinking, oh, I'm kind of hungry, and, and I wonder what that book is behind me. Like, you know, there's a whole spatial quality to how a mind works. And I think that jumping, like in writing we talk about jumping as something we are, you know, pushing our readers to do, and it's a big expectation, but I think that's because we've set up this linear <coughs> pattern, which really is a kind of um, imposition on how our minds work. So I think here what I'm trying to do is not so much get you to jump as a reader, but let you recognize how language can more closely uh, resemble how your thought might work anyway. Is that fantastic? An no, that's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Larry. It, it's really beautiful the way these poems work. I love it. Thank you. But I'm wondering, you have one thing which is the backbone of the bolding. Right. You know, so you've got a skeleton that we're really, and the skeleton, as you say, is given to you often by yeah. some other text. Mm -hmm. So, Will you ever think about playing with more than two systems? There's the bold and there's the unbolded. Mm -hmm. Will you ever do something like play with font size or play yeah. with, uh, I mean, do, do you think right. that that would ever be coming, that you could do two or three systems? I've got it, so I'm doing italics occasionally now, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, in the field study that happens, so the names of the plant, the the flowers and the uh, warblers and so forth are in italics. Right. So that becomes like a little a background that's a little different from that's great. what goes through it. 
as far as like making the tech, you know, the fonts really different or um, using color or something, like, I don't think so. Like I, I still think I'm committed to text in some way and I want them to be read. They, <clears throat> I don't want them to just be a visual feel. Like artists do that all the time. Right, you know, like when Paul plays word poems. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, and I, don't, I don't think I am artistically inclined that way, so they still have to read more as texts than as a visual field with, with words. For now, I mean, who knows, but for now, yeah. Good question, though. Jody, Jody, when you read groups like this, do you tend to read <clears throat> these poems in the same way, or, or do you make yourself a completely spontaneous as to your choices? Mm -hmm. This is what uh, David was revealing. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, yes. it, 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 I have to say that they do mm -hmm. fall into patterns when I'm reading them. Mm -hmm. you know, And when I get stuck, it's because like I go, oh, I'm going a different way. That's not how we <laughs> go. And then I have to find my way back. Um, and I am, I am like um, invested in the reading, the having meaning. That is like connecting parts that grammatically or syntactically hold in some way, n not just scattered, which is why I was getting upset when David was doing it, because he was like breaking that up for me, yeah. and, and that's beyond where I want to go. So, um, I mean, I'm always really interested to hear other people read them, because they're, they're things I don't see in them, but you know, yeah. It would seem that. When you make a choice there when you're reading them aloud, that that's that's one way the poem can be experienced. But I, I sitting here listening to you, I'm not only hearing you, but I'm having peripheral vision yeah. on the page. Uh -huh. So it's it's, a, it's an incredible uh, uh, kind of attack, <laughs> word attack <laughs> from all sides. It's really pretty terrific. Uh, good, good. Yeah, so you can go back and not hear me, you know, just yeah, like sure. do it. <laughs> I also have a question for David. Uh, so you, with the American poets you write, it's about the influence of ancient Chinese wisdom and poetry on American poets. Mm -hmm. And you looked into other countries and cultures and how that they have that same influence and how it's different or how it's similar. For China? Yeah. Not really. I mean, I know, mm -hmm. I know France just a little bit, but not, yeah. not very much. I don't think it's been as influential. I've never heard of it being as influential anywhere else. I mean, haiku was a big deal. And, you know, th this, the, the influence that this book traces really starts with Pound and his imagism. And that's essentially him using haiku. And they were very conscious and every, it was like a fad, everybody wrote haiku. And it was only, in, really the whole revol Pound, re Pound's whole revolution was really just him writing the Metro poem, or writing a haiku of his own and calling it not a haiku, but his own poem. <laughs> That's almost the whole revolution. And I know haiku was even bigger in Europe. But I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe on some of the French. It, it did. Well, Ron did it. I'm sorry. Uh, Never mind. Uh, looking at Jody's book. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were being assaulted. <laughs> anyway. are not linear, um, can they, so several poems exist, or, or infinite poems exist within one page, is that, um, if we're reading them here, is it, a, for, can readers, do you think readers can approach these in a way that they can hold several poems in their mind that rather than mm -hmm. rather than just reading one one path through and and then I guess related to that is the um, the poems seem to relate to each other mm -hmm. so in a way maybe like a fractal that one poem is uh, Um, 
Well, let me answer the first one first. I think that uh, you know this from music or Bill from visual art. The experience of a piece of music or a visual art, looking at a painting or whatever, changes each time you do it, but it, it accumulates. So when you go back, you hear different things in the music. So it's not like a different one each time, it's just that the experience of it is the, the art, right? Is the piece of art, and, and they build on each other. So I would, I would want it to work kind of that way, not, not excluding what came before or omitting what could follow. Um, Can I break in? I, I, in my experience of that is that you just keep reading it. Mm -hmm. You just keep reading and you can keep reading it forever and it just keeps building and building and mm -hmm. shifting and changing. And it's not so much you read it once and then you come back. Well, I mean, that's another yeah. way to do it. And I, I don't think I was, in putting the book together, aware of it. I like the idea that there are larger constellations. Um, there were definitely themes that kept coming back to, like the library um, <coughs> comes back, and that she figure that it appears throughout, who just, I mean, I think of her as sort of the woman on the cover, who just sort of keeps reappearing in different ways. Um, and, and then, of course, like just the natural world, and sort of like, I don't know, reestablishing some vital connection with that in different ways throughout. Uh, but yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> David, you, uh, you write about uh, Gary Snyder. Sid Corman come into your... Oh yeah, he's not in this book, but I thought about putting him in. Because he seems yeah. so related to exactly what you're about. Yeah, I lived his, most of his life in Japan. And yeah, he's the one that could have been in it. He, and he meant a lot to me. A lot of people think he, there's nothing to him that he's insubstantial. But I think if you read all of his little poems as one giant, giant long poem, it starts adding up to something. Yeah. You seen those books of his, the collected? He, has, he writes little tiny poems, Sid Corman, um, but then he's, but he just writes millions of them, and they're actually, they're, I, I have one that's two volumes, a two volume box set, and I think there are five of those actually in existence, but the other four were published pre, on the, on the, even further on the margins, I never saw them. What was working with A.R. Ammons like? <laughs> He was great. He didn't. He was like the least teacherly person I've ever met. Like he never read a poem ahead of time for a workshop. He'd just come in, you know, cold and like read it and say something smart or not so smart. <laughs> and, you know, he never like he never put comments, written comments on anything. Um, and I think, uh, and but like what he said, s s I can remember things he said. 35 years later. Um, and I think the thing that really stayed with me with Ammons is he refused authority in every way. Like he refused to be an authority as a teacher and he refused any authority over him. And that kind of the need as a, as a poet or as an artist to refuse both being an authority, like taking on authority and um, listening to authority, you know, in his, his quiet way, he just refused that. And I think that model, for me, I couldn't have learned that any other way. His teaching really happened not in any classroom, but there was a, there was a cafe in the basement of the Humanities Building, and he was always there <laughs> twice a day in the morning and the afternoon, and you just go hang out and talk about nothing. <laughs> so that's when the teaching happened. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> David went to India one summer. Don't tell us. No, this is a good story. He was supposed to be uh, he was supposed to be Archie M's graduate or assistant for a writing workshop for undergrads, and he decided to go to India instead. So I got the gig, 
And um, at the end of it, that's in the end. Uh, yeah, it. at the end, of it, he said, "Derek, I'm really glad David went to India." And he said, "Yeah, I am too." <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can stop. <laughs> I just have this urge that I want to read this last poem. This is a quiet ending. I don't know why. It's nice when things are perfect. The day is light now, presence inescapable in its vast presence. I can't say much less than this. I'm awake. It's nice when things are. <laughs>